Can you hear me better? Yes. Yeah. Great. <coughs> Not recording yet? Not, yeah. Not recording? Right now? Yeah. For this study? Postdocs, postdocs. One, two, three, four. How many undergrad students? Undergraduate. How many master students? PhD student. Most of PhD students. Anybody want to know other than PhD and and postdocs? No, that's it. Are you a professor? Yeah. Oh, okay. So what? What department are you in? Uh, same as same department. Oh, okay. Nice to mm -hmm. meet you. So are you in condensed matter experimentalist? Yes, I'm a theorist. Condensed matter experimental? I'm a theorist. Condensed oh. matter theorist. Condensed matter theorist? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. I have to be very careful today then. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, Riverside. Oh, okay. yeah, at uh, Santa, Santa, Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz. Oh, okay. Uh, Shea, I'm oh, student. Oh, okay. I see. Santa Cruz is a beautiful place. A place of the uh, Pacific Ocean. <laughs> here is what Ray and I see it too. <laughs> so it's a uh, all here students from JNU or from other place. How many students from JNU? And then uh, what other places are you, are you from? So most of here from Delhi. Okay. All right. 
Wisconsin? Anybody have been to Wisconsin? No? Chicago? Anybody been to Chicago? Yes. Okay, so Wisconsin is about uh, two and a half hour by car uh, from Chicago and, and then by airplane it's only 40, 40 minutes. It's very close. And uh, later I'll show you uh, the picture of the Wisconsin Madison. But, but, uh, So very warm welcome to all of you. This is uh, the Gyan program. At the end of this course, if nothing else, nothing about complex oxides, you should at least remember the full form of Gyan. And that is Global Initiative for Academic Networks. See, there is a viewpoint these days that everything can be learned through the internet. And when you just download, upload, and do this PDF, or all these books are available, that everything is available on the internet. All the courses of MIT and Harvard are also in the internet. The Gyan program of MHRD wants to demolish that idea. For true learning, you need a guru, a true teacher, and students who are interacting actively. So this is like building some kind of academic network. The chance that this gives you, along with the lectures that you'll be taking and along the, you know, what you'll be learning new things, the critical component is interacting with the visiting faculty. And all of you should take this chance of, uh, you know, talking to Professor Kiyom, and uh, you know, learning and sharpening your ideas and building up academic network. In the future, if you need some help, hopefully Professor Yom would respond to your emails and uh, any academic doubts. So that is the purpose of the Gyan program. Uh, Professor Chan Bung Yom, I met first time way back in 2001 or 2000. Maybe 2000. I joined 2000. 2000. So 2000, I was uh, I was doing my postdoc at Wisconsin Madison. And uh, you came from uh, Duke, yeah, Duke. Yes. Duke University. He's a prolific researcher, and uh, I don't think I mean, like in, in terms of nature and science, maybe around more than ten, probably, right? <laughs> several papers uh, in nature and science. Very high impactful research. He's the editor of uh, APL Materials. Uh, he did his PhD from Stanford, uh, the famous uh, KGB group. Uh, then postdoc at IBM, AT&T Bell. AT Bell Labs. So in, in terms of the background, he's the, the, the best trained superconductivity person at that time. Then he's now a full professor in physics and material science and engineering at uh, Wisconsin Madison. And uh, prolific teacher, a big group of students have been trained through him. It's a really good opportunity for all of us to learn about complex oxides and uh, superconductivity, multiferroics, all these different aspects of condensed matter physics. He covers them. He's an expert in film growth, but even the physics aspect, aspects of the designing aspects, uh, devices. Uh, so that is uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to uh, learn something new and strengthen our understanding uh, through this GAN course. So thank you very much for being willing to be part of this GAN program, and we hope that everyone can learn something new. Thank you. Very thank you very much. Well, um, first time, I'm uh, very happy to be here and then uh, honored to, um, to give her this again lecture and then um, especially uh, Satya Brata is, uh, um, is a good friend and what is I respect his science and then what he does is uh, I respect a lot and then this is my first time visit uh, India here and then uh, um, 
I think it's like I visited here several places before I came here, and then uh, um, it's a wonderful people, and then uh, it's a beautiful country, and then I really enjoy uh, being here. And then uh, so the next uh, ten days, uh, almost two weeks, and uh, um, I hope I can learn each other, I get to know each other. So uh, this is uh, exactly uh, what I feel very important. Uh, I mean, current. Uh, a lot of important the research is uh, especially is uh, more complex and then collaboration is, is very important and also I'm very fortunate to have uh, many uh, talented uh, um, collaborators and benefit from from those so and then uh, hopefully I think uh, we know each other and then um, and then, then building some collaboration I hope I mean the, I'm happy to uh, provide and then any resources and then uh, samples, we grow a lot of uh, samples and then uh, there's an uh, opportunity to, to, to uh, So uh, I'm giving uh, this lecture here, but I think uh, I'd like to have a more interactive and then uh, so we can interrupt in the middle, we can ask questions, feel free to do that. And then I have a, a number of slides, but I think the main, um, my objective of the sharing uh, of these, uh, the slide and the work is not just the knowledge transfer to you and then as exactly what Satchap has said, you can Google and you can watch the videos and then you can see a lot of information and trend, tremendous information. But I think what I'm trying to um, the delay in these lectures is not really just transfer, I mean, just the giving the lectures about the knowledge and then some basics. I think more importantly, how we approach the science to to uh, understand the actual materials and physics, and then uh, our unique uh, way of, of of the multidisciplinary and collaborative research is uh, very beneficial. So I like to share some of the, my lot of experience. Maybe that's uh, rather just uh, after few years from from my lecture. Maybe you forget some of the details, but I think of something how you can be more uh, how creative and then an approach to your science. I think that's uh, my major goal. And uh, so it's coffee break, we have a lot of time to talk. And then uh, so I mean, also I'm going to share some of the, my, uh, how I came here that far and then how I learned uh, from many people. Okay, that sounds good. All right, let's start uh, my uh, lecture here. First, uh, this lecture is a uh, many uh, component of, of this. And then at the end, I'll give you why uh, with these lectures has a series of like a structure and synthesis and then characterization and device. And then you cannot cover all of them, but I think I have uh, some highlights of important pieces. And then at the end, you'll actually understand why actually this, uh, all the lectures connected. So you know the connecting dots at the end. So I think uh, that's, that's the main purpose of this. So multifunctional complex oxide, that's the, of the field, and uh, evolved from uh, high-TC uh, superconductor, especially in the field. And uh, um, I got my PhD in 1980s, uh, 1991. Uh, but at the time, I joined uh, my PhD, uh, the advisors group, they call KGB. And then uh, in 1986, that's the time uh, high-TC was discovered. And when high TC is discovered, and then at the time, uh, that even we do not know what the actual material um, to show is a superconductivity, high TC superconductivity. That's a real breakthrough in science, and then both chemistry, physics, and material science, and all the uh, interesting uh, uh, the discoveries, and then uh, science was, was uh, performed at the time. But after that, I think uh, this field is uh, evolved uh, is you know, all different types of complex oxide material system, especially yttrium bearing copper oxide first uh, high TC was discovered, which is a very interesting both structure point of view in chemistry, so they say chemistry, and also the theory, and then all this characterization, and all these things is, is, is a very rich field. And, and that's why I think this, we are here now, and I'll tell you something more about it. So I think you can see that here's a periodic table, and then uh, it's a materials point of view. Um, 
single element has a lot of interesting properties, but the material I'm going to talk about here is complex oxide systems. The complex means it's not like a silicon dioxide. The silicon dioxide is just a binary, a single cation and a single oxygen. So they're a very simple system. But the, the materials, the class of materials, I'm going to mostly I'm going to talk about is a perovskite. And the perovskite is a name actually came from Russian and first discovered. And then, but sometimes people say perovskite is uh, the, the garbage can of the, the, the periodic table. Basically, you mix any two cations and then oxygen, then easily can form perovskite. But it's a lot of different types of combination of perovskite, but the structure and chemistry and then physics is a very rich field. And then, uh, so you have a perovskite, most of them is clearly you need oxygen, is uh, one of the an uh, anion, you need that. And then on uh, cations, you have uh, some cations here in the binary, and then and this, uh, the um, uh, uh, barium strontium in this uh, alkaline. <coughs> and also, we have some sort of lanthanide with cation. And then B site cations is mostly like the transition metals, and the either is this uh, 3D, 4D, 5D, and then elements. And then this material, and then combining three elements, has a very interesting characteristics in physics point of view. It's what we call strong correlated system. It's electron electron correlation is very strong. And also, it's, when you go higher, a 5D system, you have a spin of coupling. It's, it's another very important factor. So it's a play of strong correlation and the spin of coupling as a rich field and creating a lot of interesting fields. In terms of a structural point of view, it, this is the most common simple structure we call perovskite. And perovskite, as I say, A site. If A site is uh, element is here or element here, and B site cations is mostly of this uh, uh, 5D, 3D, 4D element. And then it forms this oxygen to this B site element and form the octahedra. And then this octahedra and shows very interesting electrical properties. And then uh, that is uh, another interesting perspective of we have to understand the nature of this. And our structure has distortion and then energy splitting, and then that's uh, creating a lot of interesting uh, physics uh, phenomena. And this A site cations has a different um, the, um, you know, behaviors. And then we talk about the, the structure and then uh, the physical properties of this. And then we talk about how, how we structure, as I said, and then this octahedra and A and B side cation plays a very important role. Let me just uh, talk about this a simple and the most well-studied uh, material system, strontium titanium. And then uh, strontium goes to A site and titanium B site. But I just made a different reverse structure, and I put it in A site here and B site here. And then when you have this crystal structure, and you look at the different two dimensions of planes, and either you have TiO2, uh, the surface, or strontium oxide, and the surface. You have a two different types of surface can be created. So this is another thing I'm going to talk about later, and this one forms 
the termination of this material system and then you make a two-dimensional electron gas or two-dimensional whole gas and then that's what one of the topics I'm going to cover later stage of this. So interesting part of this perovskite, <coughs> which is different from most of other uh, metals and semiconductors, and uh, it's a completely, it's a large free the degree of freedom we can play this playground. The number one is, is clearly I think the charge is an important factor, and then lead is an important factor, spin and orbital, and this all those things play the role in this uh, uh, complex like system. And then this one has a Coulomb interaction, and then the bandwidth plays a role, and crystal field plays a role. So I think that's a very important um, <coughs> aspect of this uh, this material system. And in terms of this material application point of view, and the different properties from this kind of basic uh, building blocks, and then this uh, the perovskite structures, and then you have very wide range of electrical, optical, and magnetic properties. And as you can see here, and then ferroelectrics, like a ferromagnetic, and piezoelectric, semiconductors, and transfer <coughs> conductors, metallic conductors, dielectrics, nonlinear optic, and superconductors. It's all actually you can obtain, and then this kind of interesting properties from the complex atomic materials. And then when you have this kind of interesting properties, you can have a wide range of device applications, like a frame, like a ferroelectric random access memories, or magnetic RAM, uh, the ferromagnetic materials, like M RAMs or magnetic memories. And then we trust down imaging from piezoelectric. This is a, a features. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes. I think that is the problem. Thank you. I prefer this one. <coughs> so you can actually see a wide range of properties like uh, semiconductors and transfer conductors, like electrodes for the type of electrodes, and fuel cells, and for the metal uh, metallic conductors. And dielectrics, especially new dielectrics, people are trying to make is high D, high dielectric constant material for uh, for gate oxide, and then non-linear optic materials, and especially, and then you have uh, superconductors, and then a lot of interesting magnetic sensors and transmission, transmission lines and magnets. So materials point of view, this is a range of materials, and then uh, people have studied, like the bedding strontium titanate is a dielectrics, and transfer conductors. And that this is one of the very famous materials discovered is yttrium bearing copper oxide, and that is a, a superconductor, set 90 kelvin <coughs> superconductor. And this is another cubic phase, a bearing bismuth uh, lead oxide system. And non yachting materials like a bearing titanate, a lithium niobate, and ferromagnetic materials, strontium luthinate, and the CMR material, we call the CMR, colossal magnetic resistance material, and lanthanum strontium manganate and ferroelectric materials like a PZT, lead, zirconium, titanium oxide, and then giant piezoelectric materials, you call PMN, PT, lead, magnesium, nium, and nium, uh, lead, titanate, and then one of the important material, multiferroex, and bismuth ferrite. And there's a very, very wide range of properties. And this all the properties, how we apply. So what's the unique of material is multifunctional material. And as you can see, it's a structural point of view. You can see that so silicon is only single element, and structure is, is a diamond cubic. And then structure is pretty much isotropic in terms of view. But when you look at this uh, each and better pop oxide, this high TC superconductors we have first discovered in 1996. And then uh, you can see that structure is a lot more complicated. You have a uh, yttrium barium and copper, you have three cations and plus oxygen. Okay? And the stoichiometry of this is a very important, but it's an atomic site. And the here copper oxygen plane is a important uh, the important for the, uh, the superconductivity. But you have an A site and B site and also your copper oxygen plane and then also important uh, important perspective in this. Because oxygen is in and out in this system and make a yttrium bearing copper oxide 7 minus delta and then make the material superconducting to insulator. As you can see, the, the structural point of view, 
not only very complexly different, and this uh, structure is a very anisotropic. And this one is isotropic, but this is, is a coherent strength, like a, the superconducting coherent strength, which means it's how much is the superconductivity at the beach. And then this region is much shorter than A and B direction. And that's what we call this anisotropy, very strong anisotropy. And oxygen, as I said, oxygen can be in and out. So oxygen stoichiometry is a very important as well in this system. And also cation doping, it's especially a cation doping makes this metal insulate transition. For example, first <coughs> superconductor discovered, lanthanum barium carboxyl system, is uh, without any doping of the uh, barium. It itself is an uh, anti ferromagnetic insulator. But when you add dopant, that becomes metallic but the superconductors. So it's a cation doping is, is also very important. That's why it's a, this work in the, in the complex oxide system, it's not just the physics work only. Physics and solid-state chemistry, and material synthesis, and all different type of fields, you, you need to actually interact and then learn from those fields. That's why I think uh, it's, in, it's, it's a modern like a research environment. You have to be really collaborative. I think it's very important. And then this is a lot of interesting properties that I said. And then you can combine those multiple different properties. You can make a hybrid device. And then you can create novel functionality, which doesn't exist in nature or doesn't exist previously. So you can actually create new functionality. And then so one of the functionalities that people didn't actually think about is the multiferrex. is a coupling between magnetism and then electric, ferroelectricity, or polar and magnetism can be spin, can be coupled each other in the same system. So that is a, another interesting aspect, which cannot be obtained in the semiconductor or the material system. So it's a materials, physics, and chemistry, all very important in, in this, uh, this field. So, when you look at the big picture of science we approach, is 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 very much multidisciplinary of uh, the science, and then uh, the theory is very important, and the theory and the like the material design is one of the important aspects, and then we have to understand the structure. So it's a it's an atomic structure, electronic structure, microstructure, all this important structure actually plays a very important role to make these interesting properties and then actual synthesis of this. So key part, what we do here, synthesis of materials. Because of material, we have, in order to have the best, is, you know, to do the good scientific work in condensed matter physics or, or the chemistry work, you need the, your material, which is, is a good quality, but at the same time, you understand what it is. And then you have to be pure so that you measure some properties. You really measure intrinsic properties, not extrinsic properties masked by other grain boundaries and other impurities, other junk materials. So I think a very important is synthesis is a really key, important piece. And then it's a multidisciplinary uh, fraction. And also, it's a, we have a discovery of new properties. The measurement of these properties can be done by unique uh, state-of-art characterization techniques. And then this characterization technique always actually people try to it's a, I mean the, uh, advance of the techniques. Uh, synchrotronics, for example, they have a higher and higher the brilliance of the uh, synchrotron beams, and then uh, or more coherent beams, or more like a nanoscale, very, very small size of beam. So you can pull the properties, which never been able to do that in the past. But actually, you do push the envelope of understanding material properties. So that's a important, the properties important. So I will talk, I'm going to talk about some of the aspects of properties, more advanced interaction, advanced uh, the uh, uh, character techniques. And then, and finally, and then at the end, the people ask, so what? Why you do this science? And then especially, it's understanding the fundamental science. But at the same time, you want to have certain types of devices and then looking at what the social scientific impact. Because, because you do some science, why you do this science? And then eventually, this science actually make a very important impact in human life. I think that's what 
we have to really connect this all these things. So, so you need to do this, and then you're not just looking at just in one piece of your research. I think you have to really think about, and then this. So, the, I want to emphasize is all the research you do is not coming from like your advisor. I think it's very important. Your very high level collaboration between students and postdocs. Actually, that's that's the work done, and then actually. Your advisor is a guide, and then your research directions, and then you discuss. But I think very importantly, I think that you are the one actually your driver handles, and you actually key person to make that happen. I think that's why I think you have to understand all these aspects. So I'm going to talk about here is is uh, complex oxide. It's very interesting rich field, but it's, as I said. Material is a key component to do this science. And then there's three different forms of materials actually people have studied. And the first form is just a polycrystalline form of ceramic form. And then it's very similar to like coffee mugs with polycrystalline or random texture. And then these grains, each grain, single crystals, is combined with a sub randomly oriented or sometimes texture multi grain structure. And this is the first form high temperature superconductor was discovered. The reason is very easy to make. You just make a chemical compound. Okay, you mix the periodic table A, B, e, and C. Okay, you have two different cations. Mix it, grind the powder, put it in the furnace, and take it out, and you got superconductors. That's what the first time the surprise of superconductors is 90 Kelvin superconductor was first discovered, which is, is stringent temperature, 90 Kelvin. For the first time, they didn't know exactly what phase is superconductor. Okay, so it's a very interesting first time. So we have a lot of papers published at the time. A lot of papers is good papers. A lot of papers are wrong papers, too. And because at the time, we didn't know that. And then, but I think it's, it's a lot of people trying to report their findings. But, but later, I think uh, we actually remember not all the papers published. We remember small number of papers remember and cite those papers. And uh, your paper, you know, be paper that people remember for many, many years. And then that's an important work. I think it's that you know, to do that, you have to be uh, very understand this, all these things, very careful. And then, and then, uh, um, we have to re-approach that way. And then this is problem of this one. Intrinsic properties of this material easily get masked by the grain boundaries or defects or all these things. So easy to discover something, but it's not very ideal forms of material that physicists like. So that's why Jarada uh, is, is, uh, is, is working on a lot of beautiful work, which is using high quality single crystals. And the single crystal synthesis is, is, is the next step in the people. And the single crystals, you make single crystal like intrinsic properties can be measured. And then, so one of the examples of single crystal is kind of, you know what this one is? Anybody know this? This one actually came from here, India. It's the largest blue diamond in the world, and then uh, this blue diamond is initially is a big size, and bigger than this, and sold to um, to a uh, French king, and then later is uh, during the French Revolution is is stolen, and then later showed up in auctions in London, different size and different shape, and there's a shape of this, we call Hope Diamond, and then it's a wide. This diamond is blue. We have a boron is doped, and that's why diamonds like blue. And when you dope nitrogen, it diamond look yellow. And then this diamonds, you can see this largest diamond displayed in Smithsonian Museum in Washington D.C. So if you have a chance to come to United States and then go to D.C. and then uh, and then you can go and visit this uh, large 53 carat diamond and very beautiful blue and with a diamond covered and then side. And this is single crystal. 
and then it's uh, all the atoms, it's a three-dimensional array, is perfectly aligned. And that is uh, actually, it's a uh, intrinsic properties, NSRTP, or without any defect, and then you can measure those important properties. And then the problem here is anybody can find blue diamond bigger than this. Very hard to make diamond big. And same thing for the this complex oxide materials, hard to grow large size of crystals. And then the reason why the large crystal and uniform properties are very hard, there's many reasons for that. When you grow the single crystal, there are many different ways of growing single crystal techniques. Sometimes people make Chokrasky, sometimes make a Bridgman method, sometimes gas transfer method, but a lot of flux grown method, there are many different methods people use. And then, but when you grow large crystals, and sometimes your oxygen diffusion through the large distance is very, very slow. You know, the solicit diffusion is very, very slow. The surface region is oxygen stoichiometry is good, but inside <coughs> oxygen is a deficient. So it's a, that's a one of the problems of the making large single crystal materials. And also, when you grow single crystal, it's a preferable have a congruent melting, because when you cool down, you want to have your material cool down with a certain <coughs> composition at the melt. But many systems doesn't look like this, and that's why a single crystal growth is very challenging. But a lot of creative single crystal growers make large crystals and then they high quality crystals to start with. The material study I'm going to talk about in this uh, lecture, most of the lectures I'm going to cover is thin films. And uh, so this is a very exciting um, material form and many, many reasons we study this thin films. And then thin films, you can make the dimensions is very, very small, and even thickness dimension is one monolayers. Okay, atomic one monolayers is not necessarily one monolayers. If you want to single UG cell formation is basically binding two layers, as I shown that strontium titanium crystal structure, strontium oxide, and TiTiO2, you have two layers form the one unicell. And then your lateral dimensions, and also it's easily controllable, some micron dimensions, and using nanometer scale, and then lithography, or even lithography, and X-ray lithography, or focus time beam, you can make the dimensions very, very small. And uh, so you can actually study dimensional crossover, 1D, 2D, or 0D, and 3D. We have a nanoparticles and then thin films or nanowires and quantum dot type of small size dots, you can create those things very easily using thin film form. And then most of devices we use, like a similar to like a semiconductor device, a like gate dielectrics and the source and drains and silicon and, and then metals on top, you stack multiple layers to actual electrode, active layers, and then you have a multi-layer structure is needed. And then you have stacking of this with the atomic precision, and then thin film is the only way you can do it. And focusing crystal, you can machine it, you cannot really go down less than 20 or 30 micron dimension, and you cannot go nanometer scale, very hard to do that. More importantly, you have these two R very easily can be done in thin films. And then the orientation can be controlled in single crystal too, because you grow the single crystal, you put in an X-ray diffractometer, and then you find the orientation, you cut it and polish it, you find the orientation. And that's what exactly what the diamond is too. And diamond is like what we call brilliant cuttings. There are 57 uh, like uh, facets. You find the orientation of which orientation of the crystal orientation, and then that makes the diamond crystal a lot more, I mean, the, um, uh, uh, it's, it's like light can come through. And then that's the one you can orientation control. But thin films, we can start with a substrate and different orientation, then you can control the orientation. 
And finally, and thin film can do artificial structures. And then two reasons why that we can make artificial structures. First one, when you go single crystals, you grow this heated up melting point. And from the melting point, the growth of single crystal is equilibrium process, which means you cool down very, very slow, which means you have enough time to atoms move around and reach the equilibrium. And that means your phase is we call equilibrium phase, which is you can actually see the phase diagram. Okay, all the thick phase diagram is equilibrium phase diagram. And then that's what is known. But in thin films, you grow not temperature like a melting point, a lot lower than melting point. For example, strontium titanate melts over 1,000 degrees C. So you can grow single crystal strontium titanate thin films as low as 500 degrees Celsius. Okay? The 500 degrees Celsius is far from melting point, which means when you grow these materials, you do not have enough like a kinetic energy to form actually sometimes equilibrium phase, which means non-equilibrium phase can be formed, which we call metal stable phase. The metal stable is not equilibrium or stable phase, but from when you grow the material on the non-equilibrium state going to equilibrium state, you have an intermediate state, but you have a kinetic barrier and then you cannot go to equilibrium state because you do not have enough energy to go there. So you can actually create this, this <coughs> synthesis of thin film coming from very far from equilibrium, so you can create metal stable phase, which means it's a new phases, new materials, tremendous possibility of making new materials, which has never been existed in nature. So basically you can create new materials. First time, you can make a new materials using thin films, metal stable phase. Another important aspect is you can actually layer atom by atom, and then you can artificially, you can make a super lattices, which means what well, super lattice means, not the original strontium titan lattice, you can actually stack different combination of A, B, or C, different elemental and different material building block, and you make a superstructures, which is, is new materials, doesn't exist nature. And that also create a lot of interesting in physics and physical phenomena, and then that is the advantage of the truths. And uh, I'm going to talk about a few examples of those, and then, uh, so that's a basic uh, background of three different material forms. And then I'm going to focus on uh, the thin films. But thin films are not all the same. And thin films has quite wide range of quality of thin films. Some people say, oh, my thin film is good. What definition of good, what definition of bad? And then all thin films are good in terms of special purpose of a study of material study. But my focus here I'm going to talk about is a lot of physics students here. And I'm going to talk about is epitaxial thin films, which means is epitaxial thin film is very similar to single crystal, like a hope diamond. And then another extreme of the thin films is a polycrystalline thin film, very similar to coffee mug, which is ceramic form of thin films. And then you have two extreme of the two types of thin films, but. Most of the influence people grow is in between. Not perfect single crystal, not perfectly randomly oriented polycrystalline. It's somewhat is textured or somewhat is, is grains are oriented, but not perfect single crystal. But in terms of science point of view, it's not very interesting because you cannot really actually too complex, too complicated. In order to actually probe some kind of properties, you need very pure and a certain region of properties, so especially in isotropy, you measure in isotropy of different direction of properties different, then you need to have is ideally epitaxial synthesis. Or sometimes people I prefer complete random. 
and the complete random, you average all the properties. So I don't care about SRP, but as long as this grain boundary is clean, but the grain boundary is sometimes very dirty. And that's why initial high TC superconductors were discovered. And then this boxing crystal was discovered in this ceramics form. But when you first time, one of the grad students, and then trying to make this thin films, is superconducting thin films, and then it didn't show superconductivity. The problem is, it's extreme bearing carbon oxide superconductors. It has an extremely small coherent, uh, superconducting coherent tracks, which means wave functions overlaps, and then you have to superconductivity can reach. But that is only one or two angstrom. It's a very, very small coherence length in the C direction. And the C direction is a very, very short. Which means you have any disorder, or you have any disorder or a junk layer at the grain boundaries, and then it's, it's uh, like in the superconductors, you cannot have a supercurrent can go through. And that's why it doesn't show the superconductivity. And then later, people figured out that the this epitaxial thin film has to be done. Then after they go epitaxial thin film, they show the superconductivity thin films. Okay. So how they do that? The interesting, uh, interesting uh, historical background. But they found that lattice matching and substrate and strontium tightening, and when they grow thin films, and they show superconductivity, but all the pore crystal lines are not good. Okay. So that's something is we have focus on epitaxial tissues, <coughs> and then uh, I'm going to talk about most of them. So, thin film has another interesting aspect. Not just, uh, as I said, you can make artificial structures, you can make uh, metal stable faces, but you have another many knobs you can control the properties. You can knock these knobs is so one of the now is strain. Okay? So when you grow these thin films, you have to grow this one on top of the substrate. Because the thickness is so thin, like a nanometer thick, you cannot make a nanometer thin films like a freestanding like this. You cannot do that. So you have to lay down on top of the single crystal substrate. And then there are two types of if you actually growing thin films. One, you grow home taxi, which means the same material grow on the same material substrate. That's why home web taxi. When you grow strontium titanate or strontium titanate, you go home web taxi. And then that means you grow strontium titanate or strontium titanate, these two materials are same. And then even though you grow same material, we believe the same material, but not the same. Okay? I'll talk about that later. And a lot of different point defects. And then never is a growing this exactly same material on top of this, extremely challenging. And people didn't realize those things until recently, and they developed a new process to make this strontium titanate itself same as almost same as the single crystal bulk material, and then stoichiometric control is extremely challenging because of like a less than 0.1 percent of the stoichiometry it can change these properties very dramatically. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that. One of them is this important aspect, the point defects later too. But as I said, this home web tax is a one example. But more exciting part is coming from hetero web taxi, which means grow with different materials on different substrate. Okay? So that means we grow strontium titanate material on top of bagging titanate, or your bagging titanate on strontium titanate, and then we grow those, we call this uh, hetero taxi. So the hetero means a different, homo is the same, so the homo taxi or hetero taxi. taxi means it's a registered growth. So you grow the materials, I, I see the, what is the pattern, of underlying pattern, and then we actually lay down atoms you follow the patterns of the atomic arrangement, that that's why we have taxi or growth. The one of the important now I'm going to talk about here is strain. And then uh, 
This is one example of the previous actually work. I'm going to talk about that later. And then barium titanate is known as a ferrolactic. And then below 160 degrees Celsius. And then below that, and this one goes to paraelectric to ferrolactic phase transition around 160 degrees Celsius. And high temperature, and then this paraelectric phase is the same as strontium titanate, cubic phase which means A, B, and C is all the same lattice parameter. And then this titanium B site ion is centered is with respect to the oxygen. So that's the same line of oxygen. So there's no net actually polarization or net charge actually remnant polarization in this system. So when you go through the phase transition, and it goes to phase transition from cubic to tetragonal phase, which means the C lattice parameter longer than A and B lattice parameter, because structural phase transition goes to cubic to tetragonal phase. But at the same time, it goes to paraelectric to ferroelectric transition, means you have remnant polarization. Is spontaneously, your atomic position, so titanium, is not exact center of it, it's off center with respect to oxygen ions. And you can have a either up and down state. You have a two different stable regions of free energy diagram. So you have a two different locations. And either up, you have a down state. And you have a those state. And those things can be controlled and switched by external electric field. So when you apply electric field, you switch up and switch down. So that creating one and zero state, a logic device. That's why people make this material for ferroelectric memories. Okay. So why does this strain engineering can do? As I said, in the barium titanate system and ferroelectric, you have a <coughs> elongation of C direction, a tetragonal distortion, make this material stronger ferroelectric, larger remnant variation. And then how you can make is more stable and then actually larger propagation and then very much higher temperature you can maintain the ferroelectricity. So you know to do that, it's very simple. You make this one more tetragonal. You distort it more, then intuitively you can think of without thinking very complex, without help of the theorist or calculation or computation. Just simple intuition, okay. I mean, just this one you can think of, even undergraduate students can think of the phase diagram. Okay, you press more, maybe more stable. How you can press this one more? Okay, you can take a boxing crystal. I will take this boxing crystal. I want to press it, okay? How much you can press this by single crystal ceramic material? I can take a, can you press glass door? You take a glass door, how much you can press it? If you press too much, you break it. Because it's an all this running material is very, very brittle. So you cannot go more than maybe less than 0.1% easily can break it. But in thintulums is you can actually apply the strain few percent without breaking it. Which means tremendous amount of strain without breaking this and then those kind of strain regime, you cannot do that by bulk materials. You can do only thin films. Or you can make a nano wires, you can do that. But thin films, you can compress this easily, large amount of strain. And then, for example, this is the phase diagram prediction by, by phase series, some of the calculation. When you press and compress this, like a one or one like a one or two percent of strain, your ferroelectric transient temperature increased dramatically. Okay? A few hundred degrees Celsius you can increase it. And then for example, all right, so let me can you apply roughly one percent? Or can you apply one point seven percent or five percent? How can you apply this? And you have to find the substrate material lattice is different. Lattice parameter is smaller than this. 
which is smaller than this, you grow this material, this lattice parameter of dimension, this, you compress this. But I compress this uniaxial, but not uniaxial, biaxial. So all direction, press it. Then there is a, because the volume is, is conserved for Poisson's ratio, only way you can do it, elongated that direction. Okay, so that's what happened in the barium titanate, the elongation of that direction, but in the biaxial strain, is a compress it, make it smaller. So those things actually can be done here. In boxing crystal, you have phase change in temperature is 150 degrees Celsius, but when you compress this using sulfate, we call gadolinium scandate and dysphosium scandate, those two single crystal sulfate, and you can see the different color of this, and then you can grow, and this material on top, you make transient temperature is very high, like a 500 degree Celsius. And then this is a similar type of turns, cubic phase to this is flat of the A and B lattice parameter, and then you can see that A and uh, C and A B lattice parameter, and you can see the split, and then it's a half dome, and they like this one forming like this, the C and A. So and then in plane lattice parameter here, and out plane lattice parameter here, <coughs> so you can actually see that huge change of lattice parameter. And that is a, one of the example of your screen, thin films, epitaxial thin films, you have very important knobs. You can control the properties and dramatically enhance the material properties, or you can actually find the new functionality and new properties never been seen, never seen before, because you compress your strain, you can apply a few percent, which cannot be done in, in boxing of crystal. So that's one of the knobs. But you have more than one knob controlling thin films. And that's why I think it's, uh, it's complex oxide materials. You have a rich electronic, optical, magnetic, and then this multifluoric properties. But that's not all. You can actually engineer and design the materials in thin film form and can control the knob. You have a tremendous actual playground. You can actually use this lot of interesting materials and you can control this. You can discover new physical phenomena. You can discover new materials. You can actually study new physics. You may create new devices maybe down the road. You have those new devices can be applied to another functionality, like not 100, 10 years down the road. Maybe our, it's like a smartphone is no longer exist. Maybe your different, fun different functions and different devices can be, can be used. Maybe those functions needed at the time using this. So that is some background of this. But at the same time, and then another one, this another example. This is maybe one of my last last uh, lecture is uh, nick type superconductor. This is another unconventional superconductors. And then your thin films is critical condensate is is enhanced tremendously. And this is uh, uh, the uh, Satya Bharata's early work of the superconductivity work is uh, flux fittings and the superconductivity. And in, in the uh, MGB2, and then all, uh, it's a magazine diborite influence. But I think this is the one, is a uh, nictite, it's the superconductors. And you have this boxing crystal, is a flux pinning is very weak. The boxing crystal is only 10 to the 6th or 10 to the 5th or low, but epitaxial influence is a one or two order magnitude higher critical density you can obtain. And this is because we have a more flux pinning, like a defects can pin the flux, set so that you can have a large current can apply without losing the, losing the uh, superconductivity. So that's the one of the examples, and then uh, we'll talk about it later. So now I think I have enough, enough background of interesting like, excitement of, of these complex oxide materials. And I'm going to give you a little bit of interesting uh, background here. And then we need atomic layer control. I'm going to talk about spend some amount of time here, atomic layer control goals, and then uh, a couple of lectures. 
And then when I started initial growth of these high TC superconductors in 19, uh, mid 1980s or 19, early 90s, and then at that time, one of the major challenge of the actual thin film growth is not that one. The major challenge at the time is just stoichiometry control. Even at that time, we don't know how to make each room one, each room two, barium two, copper three, one, two, three. Stoichiometry control is a challenge at the time. Very difficult to make one to three chemistry. Now everybody knows how to make one to three chemistry easily, but at that time that's a challenge. And later, he was trying to make a thin films. And thin films, okay, how we can make an epitaxial thin film is another challenge. But it's people, it's actually challenging more and more difficult and more challenges come, which is really can you control atomic layer control as good as semiconductors? Because this is the quantum structures, like aluminum arsenide, like aluminum arsenide structures. And that's actually studied for many years, MBE and molecular wave taxi, and they developed this kind of the level of wave taxi. And then, can you do this level of taxi? And that's another important, actually, many years development of this pendulum growth technique. Okay? So how can you do that? And then, as I said, initially, just growing stoichiometric pendulum is a major challenge. But from there until now, we can achieve this level. But your student, your career or your scientific career is many years down the road. Maybe you will do this science in 40 years, 50 years or something. And what is the next challenge of the synthesis of these materials or discovery of new things? And then you can actually imagine something is a push the envelope of not only synthesis and other types of characterization and, and discoveries. So this kind of growth is multiple step of advancement is needed. Okay? The first important step is thin growth influence. So when you grow your your thin films, you can actually think about very similar to building houses. Okay. First you have to find the your foundation. Your foundation of thin films is substrate. You need a substrate, start with a certain substrate. But many years we have never thought about this kind of concept of termination. We just get the substrate from the vendor. Okay, they hide the, how they make a substrate. We just get the zinc crystal, very similar to polishing of the oak diamond or I have seen a lot of beautiful gemstones in India. You have, and you get the crystals and, and cut it and polish it. That's exactly the same process we get single crystal and substrate. They polish it. And then um, it's like a, um, uh, the, atomic layer, the atomically flat, they want to make those things. But when they polish those things, and then that has a mixed determination. As I said, it's strontium titanate looking at very atomic scale, we have a two different termination. One termination is like this. You cut it, this region, you look at two-dimensional surface, looks like this. Okay? This is strontium oxide termination. Strontium one, oxygen one is termination. You look at this surface, titanium O2 termination, it's a two oxygen one titanium, TiO2 termination. When you polish those things, and then surface looks like this, a mixed termination. Certain region, the TiO2 looks like this. Certain region <coughs> looks like this. When you heat it up at a high temperature, then your atoms move around and forming large patch of different regions. This region is a titanium termination, TiO2, and this region, strontium termination. This is done by what we call friction contrast. When you do AFM scan, your lateral scan can actually see that the friction, is a friction between AFM tip and surface of atoms, and depending on your termination layer, and you have a different friction, and you can see the 
very strong contrast to different terminations. Then we grow the thin film on top, and this region and that region film grow differently. And for example, simply we grow one material and lay down here very flat, beautifully well. And this region looks like doesn't wet, like you have a water droplets, like a droplet like this, doesn't wet, like a very much island growth. So very strong contrast to different regions, very, very different. So how can you make your films uniformly everywhere, same kind of quality, how can you do that? So that's the one of the challenges we have to do is make the materials, your subframe material, either well-defined single termination. So that's what you do. Can you make just 100% this termination and everywhere your subframe? And then this technique is developed by the couple of groups. One is a Japanese group, another one a Dutch group. And they made this one is terminating 100% 1 of TIA termination. The basic background of this is a very simple chemistry. Because strontium is more basic than, than TiO2. Okay? So your base layer, a little bit of basic layer. So which means it very well easily can dissolve in acid. But you don't want to put very strong acid. If you put in strong acid, it will dissolve everything. But you have a kind of some kind of borderline with very, very weak acid can only preferentially attack strontium oxide layer, not TiO2 layer. So that is a buffered HA, like a buffered hydrofluoric acid, very dilated, a buffered one. And then that only attacks strontium oxide layer. And then you can create a beautiful single surface termination. And then you can actually see, you look at the, this, this atomic force micro image. Anybody done for AFM imaging here? You need the AFM imaging. And then this is the step height, your know, section analysis. This is actually step terra structure, typical step terra structure you can make in thin films. You can actually see here, step one, and go up, up, up here. Each step is four angstrom, which is the same height as this height. Okay? The full length height, because the titanium layer, and next to the titanium oxide layer, there's roughly four angstrom. Exactly 3.9 or 5 angstrom, but roughly 4 angstrom. And then each step is 4 angstrom, okay? Roughly. And then you do not see this kind of half initial steps. When you scan this region, I don't have an image here. When you scan this from here to here, strontium, strontium oxide to titanium oxide, these steps. So that is roughly 2 angstrom. So you can actually either two angstrom step, you can see the four angstrom step, and that, that is a mixed determination. But another important fact is your very well defined long terraces. So at least these regions when you grow, you have everywhere no steps and single surface termination. And that's the first important aspect. You make your spatio single surface termination. The next one we do is not only using substrate, you have to grow thin films really atomic layer control. Then how do you know this atomic layer control? And then we adapted this technique from MBE, because of your molecular band taxi, the semiconductor growth they use, so they call this uh, in situ monitoring technique, use reflection, high energy reduction diffraction technique, which is in situ real time is monitoring of the growth. Both, like uh, how fast you grow, what the structure is, and those things we call real time monitoring of the growth. But those monitoring growth, we cannot use those things, it's available for. It's an MBE. 
the, the gross condition of MBE is ultra-high vacuum, which means the vacuum level, you don't want any gas, like, like the atmosphere, the purely high vacuum. The only flux is coming from your elements you're depositing. That's a 10 to minus 9 or 10 to minus 10. Your base pressure is that good. Then your atoms just to have 100% of atomic flux and molecular beam ectasy. But in thin films, your source of oxygen is gas. Because think about it, you have a strontium titanium oxide. You have a, this kind of strontium titanate. You have two cations, strontium and titanium cations, it coming from metals. Or you can have a solid source. You can, you can provide those things. But oxygen is not solid source. <coughs> oxygen is a gas source. You have to provide oxygen from background gas. Which means you have a plenty of gas oxygen needed to stabilize this phase. How much oxygen you need? How much you need this kind of oxygen to stabilize certain types of material that depending on what material you grow. Some material needs tons of oxygen, some material needs very little oxygen, and depending on your stability of your materials. For example, in the yttrium barium copper oxide, and this is a phase diagram actually people study. Is this oxygen project pressure and this temperature? And depending on temperature, your oxygen partial pressure, you, this is the regions of you can create, you can stabilize yttrium bearing carbon dioxide superconducting phase. Below this region, your oxygen partial pressure lower than this will decompose to this different element, different compound. So that's that's what you don't want. So you need minimum oxygen partial pressure above this region, which is relatively very high. And then and the other one, like uh, this other material system, your different oxygen state. You have multiple phases depending on oxygen content. Your V205 to like pure vanadium and different temperature and different oxygen partial pressure. Your different regime, you have different types of uh, vanadium oxide. Okay? So that means you really need to control oxygen partial pressure during the growth. But sometimes you need to, most of cases, large oxygen, high oxygen partial pressure stabilizing. But these two are conflicting problems. One is your MB type of growth, you need the ultra high vacuum and to control the in the uh, in situ monitoring of atomic layer control. But at the same time, I need to provide a lot of oxygen to stabilize this phase. How can you overcome this problem? So the way I know explain this read, I can talk about this read pattern. And this in situ monitoring is, is a two different information you can get. The one information is how smooth of your film. That's the one information. And another information is what is the actual lattice structure on the surface. There are two information. One is morphological information. Another information is atomic structure information, crystal structure information. And those two information is shown here. And then I'm going to show you here what is this content. So, so this V, his full name is reflection, high energy electron diffraction. Okay? Reflection, high electron energy diffraction. So why that means? So just simply, I have this iPhone here, and then it's a very shiny mirror surface. And then when I blow in the surface here with, okay, when I, can you see the, this one is a very bright reflection here? Can you see this one? I reflect here, and it's very bright. Can you see that? Okay, I'm going to blow here my steam and then whether this, this light is going to be as bright or dim. I'm not sure. It's, uh, I never tried it. I'll try it, see what happens. And then, not as good because it's not a good test. 
But you can actually do, just simply, you can think about this. When you wake in the morning, I think it's a, uh, some people, they shave in the morning, when you turn hot water, and then when you turn hot water, your mirror is condensed a lot of water droplets, then you really cannot see your face because of all condensation water. But after dry out, you can actually see that, you can see it well. But this is just one layer of this. But you can use the same kind of laser point to go home when you turn hot water and you reflect it. And then initially very bright, when your condensation happened, then this one is a beam. Then once it's gone, then bright again. Okay. It's a very similar concept of this, but this wavelength of this laser is a few hundred nanometers. The size of water droplet is scale of microns are much bigger. And then, so that means it's a scatter, this 200, a few hundred nanometer beam, is size of droplet of the morphology and then scatter this very similar to this. But when you deposit atoms, size of atoms or islands, how small those things? Those things may be order of one nanometer or like an angstrom scale. And then a few hundred nanometer wavelengths feels like it's, it's nothing. Can you imagine this? Wavelengths too long. Wavelength is so long compared to size of this, and then it doesn't feel anything. So that's why if you just the same kind of laser, and on the surface a lot of atoms attached, no difference. But how can you make your wave small enough, very close to size of atom? Which one you can do it? X-ray, you can do the X-ray, but X-ray is is one way to do it, but actually that's quite deep. And then use the electron beam, the electron, high energy electrons, like a roughly 20 or 30 or 40 k electron volts. And you can calculate what the wavelengths of the electron beam. That's a sub, sub angstrom wavelengths. And that's why you can make an atomic imaging of transmission electron microscope. And then that wavelength is really can see that atoms on the surface what the difference is atoms. So what that means is your electron is electron being scattered same way. Surface is no atoms attached to the surface flat like this. Like this. Surface flat, no atoms attached. Then you will see its intensity of reflection is very, very bright. Okay? And this bright beam here initially and when your atoms arrive on the surface atoms, then same way, like a water droplet on the mirror and reflection of this, scattered everywhere, and the intensity go down. And this intensity goes down when you have roughly 50% coverage. And 50% coverage, you go down that minimum. Then when you go another full coverage of this, then you go back again. So that's a one single oscillation correspond to one monolayer. So what they mean is you really can see one atomic layer by one atomic layer control just monitoring, counting this oscillation. So that's one way. And then this is commercially available now. But at the same time, you can actually see your diffraction pattern, your electron diffraction pattern, like a very similar to TEM, and then what you do in actually the lattice um, crystal structure imaging, and you can actually see either polycrystalline, amorphous, and then 3D island, you can actually see all these structures. And those things can be done using what we call high pressure read. You operate this one very high oxygen positive pressure. You can see that your oxygen partial pressure in high oxygen partial pressure to operate. And you're to do that, you can actually see this read gun has two problems. One problem is how you can generate electron beams. 
Anybody know how to generate electron beam? Electron beam is simple thermionic emission. You heat it up, high temperature filament, and you electrons overcome the vacuum level, and electrons come out, and you accelerate from the electric field. And using some coils outside, and you bend the electrons, and focus the electrons, and that's what basically you do electron gun. And then you have a tungsten filament, temperature very high, you have oxygen, then what happens? You burn filament. So you don't want to have any oxygen in this filament side. But in the vacuum chamber side, I need a lot of oxygen. Then how you actually do those two things? And another problem here, you have a lot of oxygen here. Then oxygen gas molecules actually scatter through electron beams. So that means you have, if the mean free pass of electron beam can be very short. So your mean free pass is very short. That means the normal read guns read work in semiconductors very far distance. Like from electron beam to sample to actually imaging plate is this uh, very long distance, and then you can do the image here. But if you have this long distance, it all scattered, and you don't see anything. So in order to do that, you have to make this distance very close, very short. Not like, like a meter distance, it has to be 5 centimeter distance, or 10 centimeter distance. It's like a factor of, factor of 10 smaller distance to make this image possible. So in order to do that, basically two things. One is the electron beam is axis of electron beam is very, very close to do the so sample. And this phosphorus screen imaging of the read pattern is pushed into the chamber. It's distance from here to here and distance here to here, only a few centimeters, very, very close. But the exit of electron beam the whole diameter is a few hundred microns. Very, very tiny holes, and then your differential pumped. Basically, you have a pumping of this chamber, so your additional pumps, okay, evacuate this additional pump, maintain these two different pumps, maintain inside this region vacuum, 10 to minus 6 or lower, but in this region, you can actually maintain close to one tor of pressure. So that means one tor, 10 to minus 6 tor, your differential pumping ratio is roughly 10 to the 6. You need large differential pumping ratio because you have very small tiny holes and additional two-stage pumping make this region is a good vacuum. So that means you have a, from traveling electron beam from here to exit of the beam, inside the good vacuum, so your mean free pass very long, and then you can actually travel without scattering. You can exit here, then this one's very close, and you can see that. So that's a one of a very important step to make this atomic layer control in situ monitoring possible. And then you can see this diffraction pattern is done very high pressure you can see the beautiful pattern. And this is done 50 millitor of oxygen partial pressure, growth of strontium titanate. You can see that very nice oscillation. Okay, this oscillation, this is real data. Okay, when you grow this, you see the oscillation, which means okay, this one four angstrom, another four angstrom, so one layer, another layer. And that is possible by this method of the read. And doing so, you actually grow this typical strontium ruthenate. It's a material. It's another perovskite. It's a very interesting perovskite. And it's a, uh, uh, basically, this is uh, uh, the uh, iterant ferromagnet and also a polarized ferromagnet. And then this material was drawn on this substrate. And then I just want to show you real-time imaging of this and strontium ruthenate and strontium titanate and strontium ruthenate 
the trilayer structure. Can you go trilayer structure? And you can make first layer. Okay, this is the bottom layer. Let me see the bottom layer here. So there's bottom layer. You see that this kind of pattern. I'm going to talk about these details at simulate control in another lecture. And this is a uh, we call step flow growth region. And strontium titanate grows like island growth, two dimensional island growth. Strontium lutei go back to step flow growth. I'll talk about that later. Why this thing happened? And then uh, so anyway, you grow maintain very nice step structures. And then when you look at cross-sectional micrograph, and this all layers perfect single crystal. And you can see, and then there's no grain boundaries and no dislocation, which means fully coherent. And then lattice parameter of strontium lutinate is larger than strontium titanate, so it grows like a compressed I exhale it, compress, and grow like this. And then strontium titanate, very thin layer strontium titanate, sandwich between here, and you can see that completely single crystal. And another example is is a ferrolactic tunnel junctions. Strontium lutinate, barium titanate, and strontium titanate, and strontium lutinate. And there's a metallic layer, so that you can apply electric field. You can switch it. But you can see that that titan layer extremes flat. And then you can count how many barium titan layer, and those things is counting how many oscillations. After go all the layers, and surface is atomically flat like this. So this is the level of the epitaxial thin film growth. And let's go back and compare this structure and compare the structure I show you already, this structure. Okay? So that is how semiconductors and then approach to to make a quantum mass structure and making fractional quantum wave effect. Now, we have a complex oxide materials, much more complex chemistry, much more complex materials. Now we have a level of taxi is their level. So I think at this point, I think we have discussed clearly what is materials exciting, what is exciting materials, and then different form of materials, ceramics, thin films, and single crystal. And single thin films have epitaxial thin films, polycrystal thin films, and why epitaxial thin films is exciting, and then what knobs you can control, and then we have a lot of challenges of synthesis, but those challenges overcome by using <coughs> atomic control. And now with the level of the perfection and level of control is so reach that point, and really you can study real science of intrinsic material <coughs> science physics of this. And because you have a handle, you have an extremely large playground of this old exciting material system. But you have a handle of knobs. You can actually make these materials what you like to actually create and discover and find some interesting devices. I think right now, I think I have roughly hour and 15 minutes. And then uh, I'm going to um, invite you some questions, or I can go a little more other slides, whatever you like. And then uh, I have many slides to go, but I think, uh, I think this is something brief introduction, because uh, I want to make this first lecture is excitement. You want to be excited to come to this lecture. This is a boring lecture, why I come here this is. And this is a, your field of something I want to study. Oh, I want to join this field. And then this tremendous opportunity to actually make, study, and then you make a 
deep impact in both societies and in science advancement. Okay. Any questions? When you ask questions, can you raise a hand and give your name? Then I think uh, over time of two weeks, and then I can remember everybody's name so that in the future, in yeah, communication, I remember who you are. <coughs> Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Actually, strontium titanate can be ferrolactic by two different ways. And one paper published about the same time we had beam titanate paper, and one paper by Daryl Schlom's group and Penn State at the time, and then in the Nature. I'll bring those phase diagram when I will show ferrolactics and then strain engineering when I show. They have a calculation of strontium titanium phase diagram. Not symmetric, it's asymmetric. So asymmetric phase diagram. So you get this compressive side, you have a slope is low, and tensile side is, is slope is much steeper. And then uh, so they use the strontium, not actually compressive one, the tensile one. Strontium titanium lattice parameter actually smaller. So they wanted to have a larger lattice parameter actually stretch it. Rather than compressing this, you actually, this one stretch this way, stretch that way. And that actually make strontium titanate room temperature ferrolactic. And then using dysphosium scandate or gadolinium scandate is enough lattice mismatch and strain room temperature ferrolactic. That's already interesting that it's behaving differently Compression and stretching. That's right. But the other part of the question is: Is it infinitesimally sensitive to stretching or compressing, or does it take a critical stretching before it starts showing a ferrolactic? That's a very similar phase diagram I show. Okay. The slope you can see the slope. So all the way from zero, you are saying. That's right. Okay. Yeah, from zero percent is a non-ferrolactic. Yes. It's a is a very very low temp. It's it's a non-ferrolactic. It's a quantum ferrolactic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So when you go temperature. Is a raise like this, yeah. and you need ferrolactic around one point, uh, one percent, one point two percent, and that's the region room temperature ferrolactic that it happens. Okay. But when you have like a stretching more, mm -hmm. then you have like a room temperature, not even higher temperature than your ferrolactic. That's a one strain engineering is one way to do. And another way of we actually discovered uh, that's in 2015 is, is strontium titanate, this point defects, is a, one of the major point defects is a titanium anti-site, which means the strontium site, if strontium is a vacancy, then size of strontium vacancy is a big. And titanium goes into the site, then your room is too big. So that it, titanium is not centered, it's off-centered. Mm -hmm. So that actually creating what we call polar nano regions. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not really spontaneous polarization large scale, but a patch like this. Uh -huh. And then when you have this patch one, when your dimension gets smaller and smaller, this patch can be faced to the pole surface of the weight and bottom electrode mm -hmm. and become ferrolactic. That's what published in 2015, published in Science. Uh -huh. And that's what we call uh, ferroelectricity at room temperature at reduced dimension. Uh -huh. So that's something I'm going to talk about that later. And that's it's a lot of, like, that's a, that's a, you, you brought a very important question. And the two ways we can do it. And then that's why you can actually, in, not only enhancing the ferroelectricity of the certain material, you make non ferroelectric to ferroelectric, you can do it. The next one lecture, I will talk about something is polar, non-polar material to polar by structural engineering, which is 
another one I'm going to talk about. But I think, uh, yeah, yeah, you should come to my, my I think a very good question. I think uh, th this kind of question, I, I like to have your you know, action from this class. And there's no stupid question. I think uh, this is an all good question. And I like to invite your questions. This is your time. This is your, I mean, this is your, um, your lecture. And I'm come here and then share a lot of things. But I think it is, it is, I like to hear what, what you think and what, what you have in mind. Good question. I never given this many, two, two, two and a half or two eyes, but I think maybe it's by, my voice is, uh, Maybe losing a little bit later, but I think uh, I try my best because of my most of my class is 50, 50 minute class, but this is a little too, too. But you can take a coffee break. Yeah, and you can then, take uh, a break in between. Yeah. Almost yeah five minutes. So yeah. we meet again at 4:30. 4:30. Okay. All right. So we can now uh, the break and then come and then talk to me and then uh, this is I, I like to have a get to know each other and then. All right? Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming. So, so far, my um, pace is okay. Just uh, slow down and then speed up. I think we we'll agree to your uh, suggestions that what is the best way to we can absorb this. Uh, because we have many lectures coming, so um, you can give me your feedback early enough. I think it's much better because uh, after time passed and well, I should have talked to you and then I'll maybe improve something. So, um, yeah, just be the coffee hours and tea, the, the, the tea time and then and tell me what, what the best thing I mean, I can change. Okay. All right, so <clears throat> the first uh, lecture I gave us some uh, introduction and then why, what is complex outside and then what is so exciting and then what is the thin foodums can offer you and then we have a tremendous playground you can actually work on and then out of knobs you can control and for the discovery of new materials and new phenomena and new device that's the first part I talked about and then on the second part um, as I said I show some diagram remember the my diagram and then uh, the theory and then uh, design of materials. And then one diagram, you remember, the structure. One diagram is member synthesis. One diagram there is properties. And other one is the devices. So I talk about and those diagrams. And I'm going to talk about here is actually structure. And the structure is, is very important because you actually control
a lot of properties coming from the actual structure. And the structure is, is a different range of structures we do. It's coming from mi macro structure, microstructure, and crystal structure, atomic structure, or electronic structure, spin structure. We have a lot of different structures, and those actually control the properties of these complex oxide materials. And because the actual structure, when you look at the crystal structure I show you, is very complex, which means complex means good or bad, which means complex is you have to really understand and characterize those well to really connect those structures to your properties and then your theory and then all this connection between those two. If it's simple structure, the connection is very easy and also you get to be working with the theories in computation. Simple structures, computation is easy. But this atoms, so many atoms in unit cell and your computer and calculation is a lot more challenging. And then, but, we have a complex way because osmium is a toxic material, and they're very careful. Your osmium is basically is a lithium osmate, crystal structure is a rhomboidal structure, and then this is the converging at uh, the uh, diffraction patterns, and then you show that it's a, your non central symmetric case, okay, non central symmetric case, the polar. And this pattern and that pattern is not the same, right? You can see that, this one and that one. But central symmetric, non-polar system, and you have pattern, these are mirror symmetric. Can you see that? So when you have this, because this is a mirror plane, the, the, uh, based on this mirror plane, when you divide these, these two, this image and that image, exact the mirror image. Okay? So with a mirror image, means a central symmetric. So, so that means, this side and that side exactly the same, the middle symmetry, because we call central symmetry. But this is not. <clears throat> this one and that one different. Because the atoms in the not exact center is off center. Okay. That's the one way you can do it. So they look at this uh, symmetry of this and the high temperature, low temperature, and still maintain, they still maintain the metallicity, but you're creating and this kind of polar state in this bulk material. Okay, that's coming from, from metal insulator transition or met the, uh, the, the different temperature and you same material forming polar metal formation. But what I'm talking about here is real simple question. Okay, is it polar metals does exist? I mean it's a theoretically looks like not possible because screened. Charge carrier, free carriers are screened this. But simple question is, well, it's a very limited number of polar metals available, like lithium osmate or layer structure. Is there any more? And then can you find it? Or can you really make it? The real question is, is simple as a science point of view. Can you design and create polar metals and thin films, and but non-polar to polar converted, but still metal? And uh, this is very interesting fundamental question in for science point of view. And where we can start this? Because my question is, well, this is a good question. I mean, this is something student can bring and then listen to some talks and read some papers and bring some question, exact same question. Can you make it? Can you have a discover something new? But the question is where we wanna start and what system you wanna work and how you wanna do it. And those kind of important actually questions, science question first, then what is the most most the logical approach to actually attack those kind of problems, science problems. So, so we have to start with the design principle of this. Where we gonna start? So, so we have to first 
it's already polar, then okay, you don't have to do it. It's already polar. Lithium oxalate, bulk single crystal, already polar. Why you bother this? Okay, we have a very limited few materials of polar, but there are tremendous materials, non-polar material. We can start with. So choose non-polar metal first, and but what kind of characteristics is needed to make polar, non-polar to polar conversion? Okay, you have to start thinking about tremendous number of compound and element and the complex oxide, right? but we have to start somewhere. And second one, can you, how you convert the conversion from non-polar state to polar state, you convert. What is the exact process of conversion you can do? So, choosing non-polar metals, you have three design principles you have to think about. First one, remember this interesting thing, decoupling these two. Layered compound, you can decouple because you have an interaction between those two is limited. So metallicity confined here, and then you have a polar is far from here in different layer, and you have decoupled. So that means you have a certain material system is is metallicity, and the polar can be decoupled. What kind of material has those kind of systems? So that means. First, we have the decoupling of a polar displacement from metallicity. We have find right crystal structure and, and compound first. And second one is, well, what is the actually is antipolar state? So you have nonpolar materials. You have two different nonpolar systems. This nonpolar means it's everything centered. So, so nothing is a non-polar system. But certain system is anti-polar, which means still each cation is direction this way or this in this way. We have a still single atoms have a displacement, but net displacement zero due to anti-polar mode. Same thing like a anti-ferromagnetic. You know the ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic, you know this one? Anti-ferromagnetic because you have a spin this way, spin that way, cancel each other, so that's a zero. So you start with everything, is spin is non, non spin is like a non-magnetic spin, it's impossible to do anything. But you start with anti-polar, you break this anti-polar in a different geometry, they might be able to break this antipolar to polar. Okay, that's a very fundamental, simple question we want to actually answer. Okay, of antipolar. It's okay, this. You all right? Okay. And then you want metallic conduction at room temperature because that's a room temperature polar. Metal. So, the compound we are looking at, as I said, is a metallicity and then polar has to be decoupled. And which system you have this? You have electronic conduction comes from B side cation, partially occupied the electron system. And then, so we have to use a B side transition metal system. And A side polar displacement with oxygen, so you want to have polar from the A side, metallicity comes from B side, and we want to have this coupling very weak. Okay. Some material system, we want to have a screen well, so it's, a, it's a, the decoupled each other. So, and then from this side, and then induce A side displacement in perovskite. That's what we want to work on this displacement, <coughs> but metallicity maintained here. So, I think there's uh, some notation of this, but the uh, so A site, A and B and C axis, tilting and rotation, and you can make, and there's a three different axis, and that in phase and out of phase rotation, with plus and minus rotation. 
So for example, you have perfect cubic system like this, and no rotation or no tilt. A, no rotation is a zero. The rotation of this we call zero. Okay? And B, no tilting, zero. C, rotation, zero. So nothing rotating and tilting. So everything we call A0, A0, and C0. Okay, now remember, the greater rotation, the three notation, not like cubic, tetragonal, or something. You have <coughs> notation of the three axis, and A, B, and C, but the, this cubic system we call AA, the, so those two, same thing. And we have zero and zero, zero, which means this rotation, this is angle, rotation is zero degree rotation. Okay, but zero. But you have minus, minus, plus, which means this one is in phase, out of phase rotation. Is the plus is in in phase and out of phase rotation. You can have this rotation minus, minus, plus. You have this kind of structure. But you look at the structure here. This atom position is not center. Is it center? No. Because the oxygen ion is lined up here, oxygen here, right? Oxygen here. But this one going that way, off center, this one off center, this direction. Can you see that? Okay. This is antipolar mode. Okay. This one and that one is antipolar, so that this one is that is zero. So that means you macroscopically you measure this, you have a net. Polarization is a zero because all cancel each other. But somehow you can make this one is not exactly same size of this antipolar. Maybe you can make this one small, this one big. Then you can make antipolar is polar, very similar to ferrimagnetism. Do you know ferrimagnetism? Ferrimagnetism is is looks like anti. But its net is non-zero. Okay, so that's something. So we have operator tilting here. We're looking at this, this structure very, very carefully. And then suppression of this, you see that this structure here, direction of one, one, one direction here, and then this is a direction of one, one, one. You see that this antipolar is exactly the same equal. This size and this side, and this one, and that one, you get the same displacement, but the opposite. But, somehow, you change that this octet rotation, it's a rotation pattern, and then suppre suppressing this uh, tilt, okay, the octet tilt. And the tilting angle here is, you're suppressing this tilting, you see that tilting is is like the tilting angle is this much a tilting angle between these two octahedra and tilting angle is that much. Okay? So when you have a, the octahedra tilted that way and this is the tilting angle. I think let me check this change there. So, when you have this uh, tilting, you suppress this tilting, and then your tilting angle here is a zero. You stretch it. When you stretch this, then you stretch this, what happens is this one shorter, this one become longer. Okay? And this one longer, and this one shorter. So that means that it's, it's actually this one is a main, you actually those two, that is non-zero, okay? Because it is longer and it's shorter. And then this structure is when you look at this actuator tilting, because it's hard to draw three-dimensional drawing here. But the three-dimensional drawing, you see that this actuator tilting is actually make this one stretching, and the tilting angle between here oxygen to is cation, 
the tilting angle is, is the, the bigger. And then the system, you have this kind of cons concept of this, this antipolar, but you start with already its actual tilting angle is a non-zero state, like a large tilting angle, and then you can drive it to stretch it that way, then you can make a polar system. So which system that has this one? You have this uh, lanthanum, lan uh, the, uh, rare earth, nicolate, okay, this is a phase diagram, rare earth nicolate, and then this crystal structure of all those things, the same kind of structure, orthonomic structure, PNMA, the, phase, uh, uh, the space group, but minus, minus, plus, and that's a tilting pattern, it's a minus, minus, plus pattern, and then you have different elements here. But this one is all insulators, okay? So you have an insulator, then it's already disqualified, because you want to be metal. You start with the metal. So which one is the metal? You have only two of them is the metal here with the possibility. Lanthanum is a metal, or neodymium is a metal, or presidium is a metal. Okay, at room temperature. Is the room temperature 300 Kelvin here? Right? And room temperature, that is a metal metallic region, and this insulated region is 300 Kelvin. You draw the line here, draw the line here. And samarium is 300 Kelvin insulator. Everything insulator, right? So that's what all of those disqualified. And only thing qualified is these three. But we want to have metals, but close metal insulator transition. And then you pick all these two, okay, lanthanum and neodymium. But I'm going to talk about the neodymium system. But your pattern is minus, minus, plus. And then how you can actually this tilting pattern to stretch it. Think about it. So you have, its rotation is this much rotation. Okay, this rotation is big. How can you stretch it? Your substrate, your tilting pattern is the opposite pattern. Your opposite pattern, then you can actually release it. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to go this way, but how can you rotate back here? You know, rotate back can be done underneath substrate as an opposite pattern. You, you understand that? You're tilting, so one is going, one is a tilting, it's original structure, tilting is a very strong tilting like this. How can you move this one back to normal? And only way you can do it, this, the number TO has a deep opposite pattern one. So you actually put this one, you actually make this one release. Do you understand this one? Very simple concept, but when you're looking at the structure very detailed, and that, that is component there. So you pick this one, but this all this one, minus, minus, plus pattern, has those components. So suppressing octahedral tilting angle is one key important thing. So next step is, can you really, really do this way. Okay, one is going this way, another going that way. Can you really do that? It's not very obvious when you look at the structure. And then normally people grow one zero zero direction. Okay, but you actually a lot of thin film growth. You grow thin crystal substrate, one zero zero substrate, substrate, right? You more normally grow one zero zero. Then you order substrate, which one orientation? One orientation. And then when you look at the one zero zero orientation, your octahedral is octahedron, this octahedron is oxygen to E side octahedron connected by only single bond. Okay? Which means I have a connection between this octahedron and this octahedron connected by only single like this. Okay? So uh, this one is rotated, this rotation. And the bottom one rotated bottom one like this. And trying to rotate back this one to this way. And then it's only single connection, not very effective. Anybody done like camping? 
when you do camping, you put tent. You in your pet put the tent. You how many poles do you have? You have a single pole tent works. You put your tent here, make only one one pole, and then your tent is stable, not very stable. So you have to multiple one, right? So same thing here. You look at the one 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 direction. You we grow thin film to one 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 direction. This octahedra here, nickel oxygen octahedra, is connected by three of them. So one here, two, and three. So your connection is a multiple connection. So that means you have a three of them is actually hold it to make rotation a certain direction we want. And that's the basic concept of like a due to strong oxygen and B-side, B-side bonding connection, possible to suppress after tilting angle and transform the tilt pattern of film only one 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 direction. The one zero direction is only single connection, very difficult to do this way. But in one 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 direction, the three of them is much stronger, you can bond it and move the direction you want. So when you look at this substrate here, which one have this pattern is the opposite pattern. The opposite pattern here, you have minus, minus, plus, but minus, minus, minus here. And this one goes going to the plus direction, and this one goes to minus, so this is the opposite here, and then makes this one somewhere stuff in the middle. But it's actually is better to one plus, one minus, and make it stretch it to low angle. You, you understand this basic concept? So that means this one, the tilting angle is so very high, 11.6 degree, the rotation is large. And then you have this one, a very small angle. So that means your large angle and small angle, but the opposite one, then you actually try to rotate it, it stops somewhere. Okay? So stop somewhere. That's the pattern here. Is that this angle is big, and angle is very small, and then you're trying to connect this one, and it's a very rigid substrate, and it will, this one will shrink much smaller. But at the same time, when you stretch it, it's the A side cation going to be antipolar to polar. It's a net is non zero. Remember that? So, your idea here is two things. One is this large tilting angle to low tilting angle stretch it, make it is polar. Is antipolar to the polar one way, and then you know to do that, and then you use a one 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 direction to make multiple bonding of octahedra other than single bonding using different orientation of the ending balls. So this will let them eliminate substrate, and then fill them one 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 growth, and you make this one is is an ideal form of tilting of polar to antipolar state. So, in order to do that, actually we calculate. You provide the structural information, and then it's their regions, it's a stable regions of this, this material forms. And then, it's until you make the material, we don't know. But I think it's ideally, is the calculation actually tells this is true. So calculation shows this is a very complex plot, but this angle of this uh, tilting angle and rotation angle, this is a rotation of different rotation angles, but it's a rotation angle, smaller angle going down, and then you get, you see that it's six degree to three degrees and one degree, and your energy gain for the polar is more stable, and then this is the regions we can go. So this is a, something, theory calculation shows energetically more negative energy, which is more stable, and decreasing this tilting angle using this polar rotation, the actual rotation. So we do growth this one, is okay, one, 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 and one, one, zero, and then there's two types of the different growth, 
but you want to make sure 111 grow very well. And that's so something very, very challenging. But I'll talk about the later 111 growth. But in here, 111 growth is, is, is done using the, the low temperature growth. And then you have a 100 and 111. It's a very similar type of thin film surfaces. Okay? So that means at least we can grow atomic layer controlled, extremely smooth, high quality thin films, both 100111. And now you can compare 100111. It really, our hypothesis works. So our hypothesis is based on, based on this idea. Okay, based on this idea. And this 100, not very effective rotation. 111 is much more effective. So that means maybe 100, we grow same material of 10 direction, no effect, which means should be non important But this one is a very strong, actually, lead rotation, it's a suppression rotation, then you will see polar. So let's test it, see what happens. So grow this material, no difference. And structurally and surface, the high quality, and then the way you can test this polar and non-polar is a many different ways you can measure, but the two ways I'm going to present. One, macroscopic measurement of polar nature, which is we do optical measurement. Okay? Anybody done SHG measurement here? Second harmonic generation. Okay, so this is a second harmonic generation. is we call SHG measurement, and this is a nonlinear optical process, and which photons, the same frequency interacting with the nonlinear materials, are effectively combined to generate new photons with a twice the frequency of the initial photons, and this is a second harmonic generation only allowed in media without inversion symmetry. Okay? So that's a SHG. <coughs> SHG means, second harmonic means you have wavelengths of longer wavelengths pass through the something, some crystals and generating wavelengths is actually small, half of the wavelengths or second frequency of it. So the 400 and 800 nanometer red one and generating 400 nanometer blue. Okay. And if you have this material, have this kind of non saturated symmetry. Okay. non saturated symmetry is you know, this, this atom is not is the center. And then this is a, happens, it's a non saturated symmetric system, and this signal is finite signal. But if this is a central symmetric, this one doesn't happen. And this signal is zero. So that's the one way you can tell this is polar and non-polar. You simply shine laser and measure half lambda is there or not. But is a measurement a lot more complicated because you have to do different orientation <coughs> with, <coughs> with respect to the uh, beam and then and then uh, your your uh, the crystal axis. So this is a method of this macroscopic measurement of the polar nature by SHG and then you shine red laser and then see what is the actual uh, blue lasers, blue light coming from with respect to what orientation. And from this you get a lot of information about what direction of polar axis. Because you have a polar axis is a point this direction or that direction or this direction, we want to know which. So you get this one elongated that direction, that's the direction you get the polar notch. Okay? But very important to, to understand uh, this concept. So this is a non-destructive technique to detect the presence of electric dipole optical. When you measure this, immediately 100 zero, zero, signal zero and only red laser you can see it. And 
one one one, as I said, one 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 shows finite signal is much stronger than this in polar. So this is a direct confirmation of polar nature by SHG measurement is by simple control of rotation suppressing the rotation. Okay? And then this is the one way to do it, but actually second question is we talk about here in the beginning mechanism is suppressing the suppressing the this uh, tilting really do something because your calculation shows your suppression angle you see that suppression angle here this suppressing angle is a smaller angle gaining energy so more stable at the same time the schematic diagram here is you suppressing suppressing this one to stretching this one, this one's tilting angle and then you make this one so I want to really measure this angle okay really suppressed or not and also I want to know really this thing happened really atomic position here is displaced like this okay so what you did here your atomic position and also tilting angle you measure both how do you measure those things which technique really can tell extremely small actually change of this distance atomic distance is is within the unit cell very tiny change of tilting angle so the method you can do is two different combination of method one is is scanning a uh, scanning uh, electron or uh, the transmission electron microscope like a we call stem and then that shows actual position of all the atoms including oxygen <clears throat> so that is actual techniques we use low low z numbers you can detect we'll talk about that later because this is something uh, um, this later we'll come back and then this is another method synchrotron the uh, we call coherent break rod analysis measurement which is imaging of all the atomic positions using synchrotron x-ray surface refraction so these two are showing 100 and 111 we have two different ones maybe hard to see what the difference is and this is uh, the synchrotron x-ray refraction showing all the electron density map so your synchrotron diffraction can tell your electron density is higher and then you get brighter electron density lower you get the lower so you have this all these atomic positions and then it's uh, showing that it's a crystal lattice and then one to one corresponding here the substrate and here film and then you can identify exactly what is the atomic position here and here and you blow up here and this synchrotron is uh, diffraction is coming from I'll talk about that later but 100 you can actually see that this one is lined up here in this direction and then this nonpolar and then you have this this off center and then the polar so you have this polar displacement is a 1100 is it's a non zero here zero and 111 you have this large displacement so it's a, this, this value zero means you have a no displacement but you have a large displacement here but another important aspect I talked about here is angle when you measure this angle by this a uh, the one zero zero direction and then this a uh, connected by the single pole as I said single pole like this right and then single pole like this so this is not a very effective suppressing TT angle and that's why you see that this angle is still very high okay, so this bulk angle like 11.7 degree but when you do 111 and the suppression is clearly is is from this value to lot more suppressed here okay so that is <clears throat> the structurally and the tilting low angle tilting make this bulk 
almost the same value as this, and then you can see that how much of effectively suppress in one one one, not one zero zero. So that tells mechanism for this confirmation of mechanism is coming from suppression of tilting angle. And then it's a very key information because you have macroscopic also this uh, non-set transmetric, but really non-set transmetric, and that is it confirmed by and this method. And also we have to measure this band structures here and then you have this density of state is around here very level and in both cases metal showing the metallic behavior. So that is the one way you can actually make polar metals and then from non-polar by structural tuning of this you buy a hero of taxi. Okay, that's what we show. So, as I show that, the feedback loop is a very important actual approach. And then, uh, so as I said, theoretical calculation and atomic layer deposition and the calculation and the feedback to the theory. And that is the way to discover a new polar metals by geometric stabilization, as I said, stabilization. And then this contradicts contrast like uh, two different properties can exist in single material system and that uh, this is the one way we can design and make some material properties doesn't exist when you can create by structural tuning of it okay so one thing summarized here is the uniqueness of perovskite is not only crystal structure or symmetry of it but very fine tuning of this uh, actuator rotation. The actuator rotation, actuator tilting, and you can engineer this, you can have tremendous possibility of actually making materials of different properties and discovery of new phenomena. So you have this one, it, new polar metals by geometric stabilization, by actuator tilting, and then this new concept of material anti-properties and then coexisting in the material system. And then this is one, one example. You have plenty of other possibilities and you can do the same thing. And then I'm, I'm going to stop here and then invite some of the questions before I go to any further next level. Any questions? So I'm going to use uh, roughly one hour to lecture and then I think I want to have some time to discuss and then um, invite your questions. Yes? How that orbital reconstruction is achieved in thin film? I mean the substrate selection is important or some other controlling parameters are there? Can you, can you speak again? The orbital reconstruction. Which is reconstruction? Orbital. Oh. Orbital. orbital. Orbi orbital. Orbital reconstruction, orbital. yeah. That orbital reconstruction in thin film form, how that can uh, be achieved? I mean, uh, it depends on the substrate selection or some other controlling parameter. Okay, so many different ways you can orbital reconstruction. And then your strain is one way to do. Or you have interfaces. And then your interface creating your different orbitals. And then that actually make an orbital reconstruction at the interface. That's another uh, recent work by Charles Sands' work. In the surface region has a different orbital reconstruction, and then interfaces also can be formed too. Yes. Any more questions? Here, initially, we thought this uh, magnetic ordering involves this one too, but we didn't actually see <coughs> magnetic ordering in this system.
just uh, computers can stop recording right now. Can you stop recording? Stop it? Yeah.